Phew. All right. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Lisa Eisenberg. Welcome to this morning's webinar, What's Next? School Health Policy in 2020 and Beyond. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited um, to have this webinar and to have you all um, join us and to be joined by my excellent panelists. Before we jump into the webinar, I just wanted to do some quick housekeeping. Um, sometimes if you're having trouble with audio, not it won't solve all the problems as we just realized, but one strategy is to call in using your phone as opposed to using the computer audio. So the number to call in is on your screen right now. Um, the webinar is being recorded and a recording will be shared along with any materials um, and a copy of the PowerPoint slides uh, following the webinar. So please look for an email from us um, with that information. Um, feel free to type in questions or comments in the chat or question and answer box, um, which should be on, on my screen, it's to the right of my um, PowerPoint slides. With that, I'm going to get us started. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce my wonderful panelists. Again, my name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm the policy director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. And I'm really um, pleased to introduce three advocates that I respect highly and that um, I enjoy collaborating with. Um, I'm joined today by Amanda Dickey, who is the Director of Government Relations with the Santa Clara County Office of Education. I, um, I'm joined by LaShawn Francis, who is the Associate Director with Children Now, and Adrian Shilton, who is the Senior Policy Advocate with the California Alliance of Child and Family Services. A little bit about what to expect in the webinar. Um, we are each going to go through about five to ten minutes of um, a presentation. Each of us will have a, a chance to share a little bit of information about the, the conversations, the policies, the legislation that we are tracking currently in Sacramento and, and looking forward to the next year. And then we will have a pretty significant amount of time after those presentations um, for a panel conversation where we can um, we can answer questions and talk to you all about, um, answer your questions, and we have a couple questions prepared. So with that, um, I'm going to do a couple more introduction, a couple more setting the stage uh, slides, and then I am happy to turn it over to my colleague, Adrian. So a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. Hopefully you're familiar with, you're on our webinar. Um, but we are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth, um, particularly by advancing health services in schools. And I wanted to ground this webinar as it's building up to our virtual school health advocacy day, which is happening next week. Um, so this is this is part of um, an opportunity for school-based health providers to engage with policymakers um, in the advocacy and, and letting them know what, what you all need um, from Sacramento. So I want to do a quick plug. If you're not already signed up, please consider signing up. Last day is tomorrow is the last day to register. Um, so definitely check us out. A link to register is on our website. And with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to present to all of you today uh, with my good colleagues that Lisa just introduced, and also really excited that you're planning an advocacy day um, to meet with your legislators about the needs of students. So just a little bit more background about the California Alliance. We are a statewide association it represents organizations that serve children, youth, and families in public human services systems. Our 145 members are providing a wide array of services, um, including mental health and substance use, school-based services, intensive in-home supports. Many of our members also run uh, family resource centers. We're serving child welfare youth, probation youth, or those at risk of involvement in those systems. 
Our association focuses on advancing public policy on behalf of children and families, and I've linked here on the slide our public policy platform that we developed at the beginning of this year. And the Alliance also has a nonprofit arm called the Catalyst Center, and I've also linked here to um, our website. And this uh, 501c3 really serves as a bridge across policy and research and technical assistance. So we're currently involved in several initiatives, um, one which is a contract with the State Department of Social Services to run a helpline for providers in California. We're also an Peace is Aware grantee under the Surgeon General's initiative to conduct communications and provider engagement and provider training activities to promote the ACE is Aware initiative among Medi-Cal provider communities across California. And this is going to be done with, uh, in partnership with our national association, which is called the National Council of Behavioral Health. So really the mission here is to, is to support the field beyond our membership of child and family serving agencies. We can go to the next slide, which um, covers uh, the California Alliance of School Health uh, policy priorities. So I've listed them here. And so when it comes to school mental health policy, we really have these um, kind of three principal priorities that our work is centered around. And we try um, as much as possible to ground ourselves um, in these priorities when we advance our work. So that, you know, students have access to on-campus mental health services and supports, that foster youth um, are supported and can access specialized school-based support, and then also that there are multiple, multiple levels of support to prevent entry into special education if possible. But we also recognize that in some instances, higher and more intensive interventions um, are required. And so we must be uh, prepared to, ser to serve youth at those levels as well. And the next um, couple of slides, just touching on uh, the budget and uh, a summary of what was sort of most most important to our members and what we were supporting throughout the process. Um, as you know, things uh, really shifted in, in March with, with COVID and suddenly we were facing a $54 billion deficit. So a lot of our, um, a lot of our advocacy really focused on um, trying to prevent cuts that um, were, uh, you know, proposed uh, in the May revise. So just to go over a few of those highlights, um, in the K-12 education budget, um, the budget approved much of the legislature's version of the May revise. So we were very pleased that um, to see that there would be no cut in the local control funding formula. Um, and instead, the budget really relies on um, deferrals and additional federal stimulus funding. Um, so really, you know, directing cuts to higher education. Uh, there was um, funds, uh, $645 million Proposition 98 funding for special education services and supports. And this is really um, you know, a proposal that would create additional funding for um, those students who are most in need, including many who um, are living with emotional disturbance. And then um, of this, uh, the 5.53 billion in discretionary federal funds and general funds for one-time COVID impacts um, for schools and children, 45 million of that was allocated to expand the uh, existing community schools model. And then going to the, the next slide, um, the final budget also rejected um, the January proposal and the May revised um, Proposition 98 reduction to the programs that I mentioned here. So the alternative payment program, general child care, and the California State Preschool Program. At the Alliance, we also uh, just this year established a new policy committee uh, focused around prevention services. And so we're also expanding our, our advocacy focus to include, um, you know, what can be done in a preventative way for at-risk youth and families. So a few of the, of the next items really kind of fall into this category and our, um, our, advocacy, our advocacy to support these items, um, including a one-time uh, 30 million general fund um, this was actually unfortunate, a general fund cut for the, the CalWORKs home visiting program. So we were trying to prevent that from happening. Um, but, also, but we're pleased that the final budget um, rejected the May revised proposal that proposed to reduce um, 4.5 million general fund for the 
the Black Infant Health Program. And then um, also we were supportive um, that the final budget included uh, $7.6 million for ACEs screening and $21 million for the ACEs provider training program under the Surgeon General's initiative. And as I mentioned um, at the very beginning of my presentation, the Alliance's Catalyst Center and two of our member organizations, actually, um, Lincoln and Hathaway Sycamores, received uh, grants under this initiative. And then um, another project I just wanted to mention uh, briefly um, is that you know, we are a partner with the California Department of Education under the leadership of Superintendent Tony Sermon, along with um, our partners such as the California Association of School Psychologists and the California Association of School Counselors to really think about um, you know, students uh, participating via distance learning in the fall. And is there, um, you know, can we convene and identify providers who can be prepared to meet student mental health needs in the fall? So Superintendent Thurman has really been spearheading this effort and um, bringing together partners and providers, and, and we stand ready to support this initiative as well. So with that, I think I'll turn this over to my colleague, Amanda. Thanks. So um, Amanda Dickey with the Santa Clara County Office of Education, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes kind of framing um, the really great, uh, the politics of the great summary that Adrian just provided on what happened with the budget this year. So um, I think everyone can agree that this was a uh, this was a not great year just for everyone in every sense of the of the you know term. Um, however, I you know try to when possible focus on the silver lining. Um, and and so the silver lining of this budget year is that it was actually a comparatively successful year for advocacy on student mental health and social emotional learning. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, for the first time, uh, because of the budget allocation and, um, and the language in SB 98, which is the budget trailer bill language, for the first time the state has uh, is requiring that um, the general education accountability document address student mental health. And this year, uh, <laughs> the state has decided to come up with um, another document for account for general ed accountability. So normally it's it's the um, LCAP, and this year. There, it's also the LCAP, um, but it's a the acronym stands for something different. So for 2021, uh, schools are going to need to do a learning continuity and attendance plan, um, and this is just a one-year plan. Um, it's it's unlike um, the traditional LCAPs that we have done since um, transitioning to LCFF and LCAP in 2013. Um, but this LCAP is going to um, require that schools include how they will provide PD and resources to address COVID-19 trauma and how the school will monitor and support people and staff mental health. And, you know, there are, I would say, a handful of schools and, and I think a growing number of schools that have done that in the past, but it has been discretionary. So this is the first time that that is something um, that is actually required uh, in a general education accountability document. And I think that goes to show the um, recognition uh, in the legislature and in the administration of the advocacy that's been done um, by a number of folks, including all my colleagues on this call, um, to really push this um, issue in front of folks and help them realize um, that, you know, that students are not just missing out on um, educational services, they're missing out on collegiality, they're missing out on, um, you know, someone who cares about, another adult who cares about them in the classroom, who's paying attention to what's happening in their lives, who is a mandatory reporter, um, and, and all the other stressors that both students and families are experiencing right now. So I think that is an indicator, you know, of progress. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, another thing, again, I'm trying to find the silver lining in what was otherwise a very bleak year. Um, the uh, administration and the legislature decided to allocate quite a lot of money out of their state aid dollars. So there were there were dollars specifically set aside in the CARES Act for education, um, and 
there were also additional, much more significant dollars set aside for what was called state aid, and that was to be given to the governor to spend at his discretion. And so he decided to allocate uh, 4.2 billion of that um, towards schools, and what he's calling that is learning loss mitigation funds. Uh, and you know, in the in the language um, of SB 98, which again is the budget trailer bill, the uh, administration has specified what those funds can be spent on. And one of those allowable uses is for providing integrated support, such as health counseling or mental health services. So again, you know that you see that whole list there is is actually relatively narrow as to you know what the funds can be spent on. And the administration felt it uh, important enough to include health counseling and mental health services on that kind of narrow list. So, so I think that is also a good indicator that the administration um, is serious about uh, and understands the. Um, the need to address student mental health, particularly right now. Next slide, please. So uh, another, again, silver lining, trying to find a silver lining in this, in this otherwise terrible year. Um, so it was a really bad budget year, uh, which means that there are few specialty or categorical grants. But I, I bring this up because um, specialty or categorical grants are often are, are really indicators of what the state priorities are. So last year, uh, the state priority was clearly early education, and there was a whole lot of money invested in early education. Some of that that those funds have been clawed back, um, as I mentioned on the slide later. But but this year, you know, with the very limited uh, funds that were available to do a couple small categorical grants, um, as Adrian mentioned, 45 million of that went to community schools. Um, 112 million went towards nutrition, and then uh, 750,000 went to the Sacramento County Office of Education to develop distance learning curricula, including guidance on embedding social emotional support. So, you know, of the few grants that were specialty grants that were made available this year, um, you know, you see that mental health and social emotional support were actually prioritized. Um, probably over anything else that I have seen in the education space. So again, you know, hard to see the, um, the light right now, to be honest, because it was a really bad year for, um, for education. We have $11 billion in deferrals that schools are gonna be dealing with. But, you know, the, the positive, I, I would say, gosh, honestly, school, school health and school-based mental health probably had a better year than almost anyone else, um, to be honest. Uh, it was also great to see that the um, legislature expressed an interest and it was ultimately adopted into the um, trailer bill, but a, an intent to direct funds away from school resource officers and toward counselors and mental health experts. Um, and of course, this was only intent language, um, but it, you know, it indicates a move in the right direction. And I think LaShawn is going to talk a little bit more about um, what CDE has put into the budget and what, what they are looking to do. Um, so that, that's kind of my summary of, I guess, the politics of, of Sacramento. A comparatively good year, um, I would say that, you know, the legislature and the administration appear to be recognizing and valuing student mental health and, and schools' role in that more than I've seen, um, at least since I've been doing this. So I think there is some progress being made on that front and some recognition that, um, particularly as schools are closed, some recognition that schools were the place where students were physically housed, were the most accessible to receive these services, and perhaps it's been made more apparent that um, with school, schools actually being closed, that students are less accessible, um, and they're less parents, and, they're, and, they're less parents and um, not parents, but less, fewer adults who are, are there to um, ensure that they are safe and healthy and that their needs are being met. So I will I will transfer it over to LaShawn to um, speak about about how students are doing now. Oh, sorry, Lisa. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to go before LaShawn and cover just a couple um, state and local partnership efforts that are happening oh. that that were kicked off before the COVID. 19 pandemic and are ongoing currently. So I think one of the biggest challenge for school-based health is this 
uh, the, the need to build partnerships between your healthcare side of the equation and your education side of the, of the equation. Um, and this is something that uh, the California School-Based Health Alliance has been advocating for for a long time is how to strengthen those connections at state and local levels. Um, we've been advocating for that along with um, my partners on this, on this webinar. So there are two efforts I want to acknowledge that are happening currently. The first one is at the state level. Um, so for a couple years um, prior to this one, uh, CSHA and others have been advocating for an Office of School-Based Health in the California Department of Education. It's still an ask, it's still ongoing, um, but one of the things that the, the budget did last year was allocate some funding to create the Medi-Cal for Students work group. And this is a work group between the Department of Education and the Department of Healthcare Services, along with many, many other stakeholders, of which I think everyone on this, on this all of my panelists on this webinar are participating in. Um, but this is a work group that is tasked with identifying ways to improve coordination and expansion of access to federal Medicaid dollars for school health. Um, so Medicaid can go to fund many different types of services that are taking place in school settings. Um, and this work group is really tasked with how to um, make that easier for schools and partners to leverage um, to address student health needs. So it's an, it's an ongoing effort. I think uh, we had, the work group had our second meeting um, a couple months ago. There's going to be a meeting again in November. I believe an, an interim recommendation and report is due out this fall with a final recommendation and report a year later. Um, so. It's not an Office of School-Based Health, but I think it's definitely a step in that direction to increase coordination between um, two departments that really have a role and responsibility to address student health needs. So that's happening at the state level. At the local level, um, I think w one of the things that we have heard from stakeholders, from school mental health stakeholders, is that it's really hard to leverage collaboration between county behavioral health agencies school districts, uh, county offices of education to really do the integrated work that um, young people need in school settings. Um, so also included, not in this current budget year, but in last budget year, was um, a pretty significant investment to facilitate those partnerships. So this was called the Mental Health Student Services Act grants, MHSSA grants. It's funding that's being distributed through the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. This is, this is the, the state commission um, that sort of oversees and plays a leadership role in County Mental Health Services Act funding. Um, so these grants go to fund partnerships be between county behavioral health departments and local education ed entities for the purpose of increasing access to school mental health. So we had a first round of grants that were um, distributed uh, before COVID happened, and then we had we just the um, commission just announced a second round of grants. So there are two grants that are going to counties that have existing partnerships. Um, I don't recall the counties off the top of my head, but maybe some of my <laughs> my partners when we get to our our question and answer can illuminate that. But 10 grants went to existing partnerships, and then um, the commission just announced eight new grants um, to counties and local education entities that um, don't have partnerships um, on the books. So this is, this is a pretty significant investment in creating school mental health systems. Um, so I'm ex we're excited um, to see how those evolve and, and what best practices and learning comes out of that. Um, I would say that I just wanted to make a little plug that the California School-Based Health Alliance um, is actually in the process of developing a school mental health implementation guide to support these 18 partnerships and other county uh, local education entity partnerships um, in the future. Um, I think one of the things is 
there's so much learning and support that um, needs to happen to, to facilitate these partnerships. There's a lot of technical assistance needed. And so this, um, this toolkit and guide will, will hopefully be one step in, in that support. And someone, I think maybe one of my pan panelists greatly uh, found the, the, grant, the grantee. So the awards for existing partnerships were Humboldt, Mendocino, Placer, San Luis Obispo, Solano, Tulare, Fresno, Kern, Orange, and Ventura. Ventura. And then the new partnership recipients are Calaveras, Madera, Tehama, Tehama, Tehama uh, Trinity, and Modoc, um, which is a which is a working together. Santa Barbara, Yolo, San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Santa Clara. So. Those are the counties. We can we can share that after we can share that information after the webinar, as well. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague Lashawn, who's going to sort of frame the conversation for what 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 this looks like for young people moving forward. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning. Thanks everyone for having me. I'm really excited about having this conversation today. Um, I think it's important as we talk about the investments that the state has put forward for schools this year and as we think about Advocacy Day, to have a general understanding of where students are right now and what you can expect emotionally, mentally from many students once school starts back up. And regardless of whether it's in person or virtual, I think that um, having a better understanding of how COVID-19 is impacting students and families will help all of us think through the supports and services that are needed. So I think we would say that there are three things happening simultaneously, right? And the first is what's happening in community, particularly around racism. And I'll highlight what's happening for our Asian Pacific Islander students and families, as well as our Black students and families in a minute. The second thing that's happening is everything around COVID-19. And that, and what I mean by that would be the health and economic stressors of the pandemic itself. And then the third thing that's happening is our shelter in place order and what that means for access to, to supports and services. Right? So COVID-19 really has shined a bright light on the conditions in our communities that have caused emotional um, instability and mental and anxiety and depression in our youth, right? So what I mean by, by that is prior to, prior to COVID-19, there was always a concern about racism for communities of color. Um, but when coronavirus hit and the national racist rhetoric around the origins of COVID-19 um, we were made aware that our API students were facing harassment, not just in communities, but also in schools, right? So, for example, students in LA and Southern California reported that they were getting comments from teachers, like uh, I think one teacher sent their student to, you know, the, the office for coughing, um, bullying from, from other students, right? So, school was really quickly in March becoming not a safe place for some of our API students. And then once shelter in place began, they weren't immune from those, those attacks, right? So um, since March, Asian Americans in California have self-reported over 800 incidents of discrimination and harassment. Uh, that includes 81 incidents of assault, 64 potential civil rights violations, um, and nationally, California and New York account for almost 60% of all reports um, from the API community about xenophobia and racial harassment. So, you know, you're really dealing with right now a community that is concerned about their safety. And as you all know, once you're concerned about your safety, um, your anxiety is heightened and your, you know, possible depression is heightened, right? So we're really on the lookout for what, um, what this moment with COVID-19 means for our API students, right? Um, 
you know, when we talk about what's happening in communities, I think that the national conversation around police violence and race is not new for the black community, but with the video of George Floyd that was circulated, I think it really brought um, forward a, a national conversation and a bright light on police brutality in, in, um, in community, in black communities. Um, and you really have just seen this explosion around the conversation of race and policing in America. I think the Washington Post reported that Black Americans in particular reported a significant spike in feelings of anxiety and depression after the George Floyd video was made public than any other racial group. And that is in large part because of the fact that uh, Black Americans were describing the ability to see themselves in George Floyd. And this is important because we know that black adolescent males who have been exposed to nationally publicized cases of police killings through the media have serious concerns about their personal safety and mortality in the presence of police. And we know that black males exposure to police violence correlates to higher level of post traumatic stress disorder than for any other demographic group. Right. So, you know, right now, while obviously, uh, you know, overt racism and violence isn't new, the conversations around them are new, you know, in large for America and what it means for um, our black students and what it means for our API students, I think, has to be taken into account as we think about some of the more common, you know, mental health concerns like anxiety and depression. So the, the second thing I think that's happening is COVID-19, the pandemic, the virus itself, right? There are obviously health concerns around COVID-19 um, as well as economic stressors. And they go, they really do go hand in hand. Um, you know, there is a fear of sickness of COVID, especially for families with essential jobs. And we know that in California, the uh, families to more likely have essential jobs, those jobs that require you to be out and interacting with individuals every day um, are black and brown, right? Um, and the fear of economic hardship, you know, due to COVID is real. I'm sure everyone saw the uh, national report today about how the U.S. economy is doing and it is not doing well. But I think the, the concern here is that the fear of economic hardship um, is something that youth of color have always worried about, and we know they'll probably be worrying about it uh, more now, right? So youth of color disproportionately are more stressed about things like housing stability, personal debt, food insecurity than their white counterparts. Um, and so just to kind of give you some, some understanding and, and numbers around there, um, youth of color report about 41% uh, of them report that personal debt and housing instability, et cetera, are of major concern, while only about 30% of you know, white uh, young people are saying the same thing. Um, and only 24% of white young people are saying housing instability is a really big concern for them, right? So we understand that the stressors of COVID, right, even for young people, we don't necessarily think about young people and their impact on workforce. But really, it's not that. It's young people living in houses and living with adults who are concerned about, you know, how they're going to pay bills or how they're going to eat or where they're going to live. And that stress gets carried by young people in, in the household. So um, I think that that's probably the, the big takeaway here on what it means to be living through the pandemic. Right now, for a lot of students, uh, is that many of them are having a, a disproportionate concern around the health of their family members um, and what it means for their economic stability as a family. Um, and shelter in place kind of exacerbates all of this, right? So, shelter in place, we know, means that schools aren't open. And schools we have long seen as a place where we can have touch points with students and touch points. Um, to better understand how they were feeling emotionally and hopefully provide, you know, mental health support. But what it also means is that the informal uh, places and organizations that families and children and youth would get support are also closed, right? So there are your formal routes of, you know, care, which I would say schools could be pretty formal at times. 
um, as well as a doctor's office or, you know, therapist. But the informal ways of getting care or taking care of oneself, like your faith-based uh, institutions, like your youth centers, those are also closed. So, you know, where many students might have been able to um, talk through their stress around race in some of these community settings, um, they're having to find other ways to do it either through Zoom or they're not doing it at all. So, you know, those are the concerns right now about how shelter in place is really, um, it's, it's really ha had a, a limiting impact on students who um, were able to get their emotional support from um, other spaces. So I'll stop there and, and kick it back to Adrian, but I think those are the, the major three takeaways for, for us as we think about what services um, and support students will need when schools reopen. Thank you. Um, thank you, LaShawn. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think, you know, if I could wrap, like, I think if I could transition us to the panel questions, I think it's been a year. And, and this next year, I think, you know, the task for schools and school based health providers is going to be um, pretty significant. With, with that, um, again, I want to, I want to thank my panelists um, for presenting on um, their items. Um, I'm going to open it up. We wanted to have a little bit of a discussion, little, a little bit of um, some panel conversations. If you are um, a participant in the webinar and if you have a question that you want us to discuss, please feel free to type it into the chat or Q&A box. Um, we'll get to it. I, um, and, you know, we have lots of time for, I think, a really fruitful discussion. Um, I'm going to kick us off with a question to my um, peers is, so as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a school health advocacy day coming up on August 5th. Uh, if you were uh, support, if, if you were supporting and coaching our school based health field as they're getting ready for those, those visits, what talking points or strategies would you offer to them as they're getting ready, ready for those upcoming coming meetings? What do you think is a fruitful thing for our field to be sharing with legislators and their staff right now? So um, I guess one of the things I would start with is uh, legislators and, and committee staff don't often hear thank you. So I would lead with that. Um, you know, the, there was a, as you mentioned, MHSSA was a big investment um, and one of the first times that we've seen the legislature um, make a strong statement that they believe that mental health belongs in schools. Um, and that effort was really led by the Senate Budget uh, Policy Committee and Senator Beal. So a thank you, I think, is, is where I would probably start the conversation. Um, and, and I actually, so one of the things that um, I, I was, until just recently, I was with the County Superintendents Association while I was there, we had quite a few meetings at the beginning of this year where we kind of sat down with, um, with the assembly folks from education, health, and budget committees, and same thing on the Senate side. And I felt a receptiveness in that um, conversation from the staff that I've never, I've never felt before to this topic. So I, I actually don't think that it's an uphill battle. Um, I think that they are actually quite receptive to this conversation right now. I would um, I would echo all of that um, absolutely, and I would also just add that um, remember your expertise. Um, you know, you are the experts. Have confidence in that, and advocate for the students. So, for example, like legislators really want to know what you are seeing on the ground. Um, what concerns do you have? What do the students need? I mean, you have you have the bird's eye view on that. Um, and again, they're really interested in hearing from you and receptive to this information about how they can help solve problems. And um, it really, you know, seems to me that schools and kids are really on everyone's minds right now. So the timing of, of this advocacy day couldn't be better. I, I agree. I don't think I have much to, to add, um, you know, besides what my two colleagues said. And, and I think really just reinforcing those links between, you know, why now is, you know, 
so it's so vital right now due to COVID to really make this investment and to really focus on the mental health of kids. Great, thank you. Um, a couple questions have come in from our audience. Um, the first one is, how can local advocates engage with the Medi-Cal for Students work group? Is there a channel of communication or public engagement that providers and others can engage with? Um, since I presented, on, I'm happy, I'll just jump in. Yes, um, I think the, the official membership of the work group is set, but um, you can absolutely go online. I think it's Medi-Cal for Students, um, dot com or dot org. Um, you can search it. Um, and we I'll include a link to the website for the work group in our follow up email. Um, but yes, you can go online, you can see notes from the meetings, you can see who the roster is of work group members. Um, and you can see agendas for upcoming meetings. Um, it is it is a public work group. So there is time in every meeting for public comment. So if you are a provider um, that wants to uh, offer content and information, that is absolutely a strategy you can try. Um, and I would also, you know, encourage if, if there are particular members on the work group that you feel like are aligned with the work that you do, um, it's certainly reasonable to reach out to those work group members and, and set up a call or meeting with them and help, and help advocate, advocate for your position that avenue as well. I don't know if anybody else from the panel wants to add to that answer. Um, another question that came in was at least six states in the US, Florida, Maine, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, and Virginia have mandated mental health instruction in schools. I'm assuming that's um, instruction for students. Um, and then the, ask, the question is with CSHA, and I will throw it out to the rest of my panelists as well, um, would, would CSHA or any of the partner, the organizations represented on this panel be interested in supporting mandated instruction? So um, I, I guess I can start. Um... Politically, it's not a great year to be mandating um, anything for schools right now, because again, we're facing an $11 billion deficit. So I don't know how that would play um, in the conversation. I, I would point back to the, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the learning continuity and attendance plan and the mandate that um, that, that plan include information, which means essentially include action that the school will take in order to provide professional development um, and services and resources for student mental health. Um, would we support uh, the inclusion of that in the future, uh, you know, of mandating, um, you know, I guess social emotional learning? I think yes, probably. This happens to be a really um, unfortunate year for that kind of advocacy for any sort of mandate, um, but but yeah, I think a lot of us and probably all of the panelists on this call would support that. Um, just we recognize that the policy might not be there right now. This is Adrian from the California Alliance. We absolutely would love to um, explore that with our partners. And you know, there's, um, I think, even a broader coalition than um, those represented on this call who you know would support that as well. Um, so I, I love that question, and I love the thinking around that. I also think that there, um, Alashan, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I, I think not, not student instruction, but I think that there have been efforts in the past to do teacher, teacher and school staff training on youth mental health needs. Um, so I, I don't know, Lashawn, if you want to speak to some of those efforts in the past. Yeah, so we, um, we've been long term supporters of uh, you know getting staff trained and that being the ability to identify um, the mental health needs of, of children and youth. We would love if it was mandatory. We have really come up against the politics of what it means to mandate something in the school system. Um, so yes, I mean, I think that sounds great and radical and I would love to do that. I think our experience has been that that is um, unlikely. 
I think you're hearing from a lot of folks that um, have had state level, if they're not currently doing state level advocacy, they have lots of experience, but it, it is ed education policy right now and politics is really hard to do state level, um, implement state level policies and, and mandates um, because, so, because of local control, because there's been such an effort over the past year and it's not just funding, it's also decision making and uh, priorities and policy making that has absolutely been um, uh, given, um, allocated, dispersed to the local levels, which, you know, have really positive, that's a really positive change in some regards and it makes it really challenging to do uh, some of the state level mandates. <laughs> One one thing I was going to add on this point that um, we've supported and um, and are encouraging is having a, a NAMI on campus, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, on campus, which are student-led clubs that tackle mental health issues by raising awareness, um, educating the community, supporting students. So that's another avenue. And if um, you know that's something you're interested in exploring, we can connect you um, with the NAMI folks. To, to see if that could be possible um, on, on the school campus. It's another, another way to go about this and support students' mental health. And I'll just do a really quick plug for Santa Clara County. So um, about two years ago, we implemented trauma-informed training for all of our early learning um, providers. And we, we serve about, I think it's somewhere in the range of 3,200 students in early learning and care through Head Start and preschool. Um, and, and in the last year, we've decided to significantly expand that. So we have a lot of trauma-informed um, instructional offerings, PD offerings, um, uh, professional learning community offerings. And of course, all of this is happening via webinars right now because um, we're all you know, engaging in distance learning. Um, but we, we have put together a really, really strong portfolio of those types of trainings and an entire strand. Um, which is both focused on trauma-informed training, but also anti-bias training. So we're trying to lead the way in that, and, and um, we're making those trainings free and accessible to all of our districts, as well as obviously our county office staff. So we're trying to set an example um, with the hope that, you know, that kind of creates momentum in that direction. Um, another question from our audience. Um, Adrian or Amanda, as you talked about sort of the budget provisions, this question is, do the budgets um, include provisions for access? So I think the provisions around school mental health or social emotional learning and addressing that for students' needs, do any of the provisions um, include, uh, sorry, do any of the budget items include provisions for access to, child and ad to a child and adolescent psychiatrist? And if not, what is the process if a child needs a referral? So that, I think, um, and Lisa, you can speak to this too, in the SD75 work group, uh, one of our first conversations that was very interesting because what we found was that we had, you know, representation from quite a few districts and county offices. And you, one would think that the answer to how does the referral process work would be simple. And what we found is it is in no way simple. Um, it is very, very different depending on county. Um, and it is also in districts, even within the same county, the districts can deal with the referral process very differently. Um, it can range from, you know, the, the teacher does a direct referral. It can range from the teacher refers to the counselor who does the referral. I mean, they're all various different ways um, that folks have for doing referrals. Um, and, and I think part of that probably has to do with whether or not the district or the county office has the resources to have a counselor or a psychiatrist on staff and the relationship that exists with the county behavioral health department. So, you know, that I think is one of the goals of SB 75 um, to make recommendations as to what is the best practice for um, connecting students to tier three services. Yeah, I, I don't think there's much to add to that. Amanda covered, covered the issues very well um, about just how much that varies across campus and across county lines. Um, I think this is the last question that we have from the audience, but again, if other folks have other questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. Um, 
So this is, have any of you heard of discussions or maybe you've encountered, uh, encountered other organizations that are um, engaged in the conversation around physical activity and or quality movement breaks as an avenue to help with student mental health? Is that anything that any of uh, my colleagues on, on this call are, are engaged in or connected to? So, I mean, I can speak from the, health, from the school perspective. Um, the, believe it or not, the only um, subject matter in K-12 education that has required minutes per week is uh, physical education. So there are no required minutes of math and no required minutes of social studies um, or English language, et cetera. The only thing that does have a requirement is physical education. I will say that that requirement has been waived for this, the coming year. Um, for obvious reasons, I think, um, you know, we can't provide physical education via distance learning. I mean, we can encourage kids, of course, to go outside and play. Um, and even then, uh, when, when hypothetically students do return to campus, there are various different um, reasons why, uh, you know, state and local health orders have indicated that uh, we need to be cautious, right, about um, participating in physical education and, and not, um, well, doing so in a way that ensures that students are not touching the same surfaces um, and therefore, you know, leading to the spread of COVID-19. So I, I would say, yes, California actually was an early adopter of the recognition that physical movement is needed. Um, and, and that is the only subject matter where we actually have mandatory minute requirements. Yeah, so we obviously um, know the science behind the importance of physical education and mental health, physical health and mental health. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we have been proponents of, um, not just inside the schools and the importance of physical education in schools, but also, you know, really pushing um, the state to think about how they invest in communities and their physical spaces, right? So as we're sheltering in place, it doesn't mean that you can't go for a walk or go to the park, um, but depending on how your community is laid out or what your community dynamic looks like, that may um, be easier for some than others. I'm gonna close this out with one last question to the panelists. Um, so looking forward, you know, we no, nobody here has a glass ball. We have no idea what's, what's coming down the mo next month, next year, but best guess, best guesses. Um, what do you think are some of the main issues in health and education that policymakers in Sacramento will focus on um, in the next year? Um, well, I can tell you that there are some conversations being had um, in the context of the SB 75 work group, as well as the Cal AIM conversation, which is temporarily paused right now. But conversations about um, how the state participates in the Medi-Cal program. And I mean that from the perspective of the LEA Billing Option Program, the ESMA program, um, how we deliver behavioral health services, et cetera. And there are a number of advocates, including you know, the folks on this call, who are, are engaging in advocacy on and raising questions about how the state has chosen to um, you know, claim services and how to participate in the programs that are available and whether the way in which we are currently drawing down those funds is the most effective way. And I, I, I don't even think it's a question at this point. California is 43rd in the nation for drawing down LEA billing option um, funds. So we know that we are not, we're not doing a good job as a state. And, and I think um, there are a lot of folks who are looking at this issue and trying to figure out how can we maximize, um, you know, claiming for Medi-Cal services in schools so that we incentivize that kind of behavior for districts to participate and provide the, participate in Medi-Cal and provide the services to students. How do we break down barriers um, that currently exist uh, so as to facilitate, um, you know, mental health services on campus. So I, I wasn't sure, Adrian, if your question was um, broader, like a broader question on what they'll focus on. Um, but since I, I like that question more, I'll answer it. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, 
I I think that this, the legislature and the state will focus its health efforts. I'll talk about their health efforts first. Their health efforts primarily on all things COVID. Um, I think that's kind of what I'm seeing right now is if it's not COVID related, whether it's PPE or, you know, uh, helping, you know, staff um, in hospitals or any of that, that is, I feel like that's going to be take the, the majority of the conversation at the time. Because I work in the mental health world, I do feel sometimes that I'm a bit siloed into thinking that the state is talking about mental health more than they actually are. So I'm always surprised when I go into some of the larger health conversations and I'm like, oh, you guys are not really talking about mental health here. <laughs> um, so I, I will say that I think it's going to be very pandemic related and, and directly pandemic related. They, you know, I think they're going to define um, health in the next year as the physical support of COVID, the physical, the, the support of COVID-19 in terms of how it impacts one's physical health. Um, on, on the education side, you know, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is really the focus on um, how to do distance learning better and well and to support, you know, staff and families on distance learning. I think that's where they'll put their, their focus and their money. Um, but again, I don't have a crystal ball. I could be completely wrong, but that is, that's my prediction. And I'll just end by saying, you know, in terms of what we see, um, the issues that will need to be addressed um, for policymakers is, is that like, we are gonna have to come to a reckoning and address the trauma from COVID and the isolation um, that's happening and the families that are living in very stressful times. Um, you know, we're hearing this from our members, the families are struggling, um, teachers and, and school staff are going to be hearing some very hard stories, both, you know, via distance learning and probably also then when the kids eventually go back to school. Um, so, you know, in terms of like solutions, I mean, one, you know, one thing is we need to build um, better online assessments and better referral pathways, as we were talking about earlier, for students into behavioral health. That could be at the, the county and the community based um, level, but also through commercial insurance as well. And I'm just going to add not to answer my own question. Um, I think telehealth is telehealth and um, telehealth care is going to be an interesting conversation. I know we didn't talk about it a lot on this webinar, um, but I know that it's both um, both making sure as you know, schools are still doing distance learning and their campuses are closed. How are school school providers and community partners able to deliver that care via telehealth? Um, and then also, I think that there's an interesting conversation about continuing those flexibilities after this immediate health crisis and school closures is over. Um, so Thank you, everyone. I know we ran a little bit over time. Um, I want to thank my panelists again and my co-presenters. Um, it was a pleasure working with you all, um, and I always learn more when I, I get a chance to engage with them. So again, I want to thank Adrian, LaShawn, and Amanda, um, and thank all of our participants for tuning in. Um, again, we will be following up with a recording of the webinar and the webinar slides um, very shortly. Um, be well, and I hope you can join us on Advocacy Day next week. Thank you.